Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series. I'm John Racanelli, the CEO of the National Aquarium. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, our program tonight is a really cool and really unique approach. <clears throat> it's called Bay, Harbor, and Home, Exploring and Restoring Special Places in the Chesapeake. And this is a really exciting partnership with our friends of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. We're going to talk about them in a minute whose Blue Beacon series is intended to build communities of support for MPAs, marine protected areas, through events just like this across the country. And their, uh, their energetic and wonderful CEO is gonna be speaking to you in a few minutes. <clears throat> um, we've had the pleasure of hosting the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series here at the Aquarium now for 15 years, more than 15 actually. And it is with eternal gratitude to the Bank family that we present this program to you several times per year. Um, as I think many of the people in the audience know, but some might not, Marjorie was a photojournalist, an environmentalist, a diver, and an explorer. Um, her life ended all too soon in 1994, but in her memory, and I think presciently and wonderfully, the Bank family endowed these, le these lectures in her honor and memory. And it's been deeply gratifying for us to play a part in sharing her love of the ocean and the environment that she spent so much time in, her sense of adventure, and her legacy of conservation for the, and, and respect for the natural world. So um, we love thanking the Bank family every single time we get to do one of these lectures for which their, their support um, covers all the costs. I'd also like to recognize um, the entire aquarium family of members and donors and volunteers and staff who make it possible for the aquarium to connect people with the aquatic world through our exhibits, our education programs, our conservation initiatives, and more. Um, we've got several staff here tonight. Um, I, I'm very proud of our team. They're pretty damned amazing. And who, they not only work really hard at this, but they also care very, very deeply about what we do. Uh, I get to give this, the basic housekeeping message here, too, so I'll do that right away. Um, if you submitted a question online for the Q&A portion of the program, which comes up after our speakers have had a, a chance to talk with you, um, we have those, and thank you for sending those in. Um, we've also distributed blank index cards, and hopefully you picked one up on the way in, and we really want to encourage you to jot a question for our panelists um, if one arises. We'll collect those um, at the beginning of the Q&A session later. So tonight, we're going to turn our attention to our wonderful national treasure at our doorstep here, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, 18 million of us live in the watershed. And we sometimes take this largest estuary in the United States and the most important in North America for granted. And the history of the Chesapeake Bay, I think, is probably not a secret or a surprise to most of you here. It is one of the most important byways uh, waterways, sources of food and commerce and transportation, but most importantly of inspiration for literally hundreds of millions of people throughout the years. Um, it benefits us emotionally, well, I'll say emotionally. In fact, I guess I could try three E's on this, emotionally, environmentally, and economically, um, and culturally. And, and we should be compelled to restore and protect it. And that is exactly what um, this interesting group is going to talk about tonight. Uh, our moderator for tonight is a person that I've come to know a bit and, and really respect. And uh, Chris Surrey is the CEO of the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation, CEO and president. Um, she's going to introduce and moderate our panel of experts. But I want to say one of the things about partnering with the foundation that we find so eminently uh, uh, satisfying and exciting is that they exist for the purpose of promoting and extending the impact of this nation's world-class marine sanctuary system. And it has been a model for the world, literally, to, uh, to have this sanctuary program. And the foundation really accomplishes so many things that NOAA would not be able to do if not for its private sector partner. They're going to highlight tonight the panel, which she'll introduce to you, um, a, a few of the Chesapeake special places, um, and as examples of how community-based efforts 
can help safeguard this watershed for future generations. So again, on behalf of the aquarium, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for being here. I'd like to thank our panelists. And now, turn it over to Chris. Thank you. John, I want to thank you and the National Aquarium for hosting us here this evening and making tonight's program part of the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series. It's also part of a new series we started called Blue Beacon, and that was started with the idea of we didn't want to um, just be kind of in our offices in Washington, D.C., talking about the value of marine protected areas. We wanted to make sure we were coming out to communities and having a real opportunity to talk about how marine protected areas really impact um, conservation of species, preservation of maritime heritage, and are really important to the livelihood of coastal communities. So tonight, uh, we're really fortunate to, to be focusing on the Chesapeake Bay, what an incredible um, ecosystem we have here in different ways people are trying to protect it both its very unique and long cultural history as well as its beautiful um, and unique natural history as well. Um, our Blue Beacon series, um, we're really fortunate to have um, two people that are uh, friends of the foundation that sponsor it, a very close friend of ours um, uh, helped um, sponsor the Blue Beacon series for us as well as the Cruise Line International uh, Association. So let me just take a moment to talk about the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. We're the nonprofit partner, as John mentioned, to the National Marine Sanctuary System. And until tonight, let me just have a show of hands. Don't be embarrassed. Who'd actually heard of a National Marine Sanctuary? Okay, we have a, we, we about 50%. About um, these are our nation's blue parks. But because they're underwater, um, we don't have a sign that we can put on a piece of land, and we don't have a border that we can mark off, it's often really difficult to, pe to recognize that NOAA helps pr conserve these very special areas for this current um, generation as well as future generations. So a lot of what we're trying to do, and, and really working closely with aquariums, is get people to realize that these marvelous species, um, these unique e ecosystems that they see in aquarium, exist out there in the natural world, and you can actually take actions to help protect them. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, tonight. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, and I'm hopefully going to do the slides right, um, we're going to talk about Mallows Bay tonight, and I, I just want to kind of highlight it here right now, and that's because um, Maryland has something to be very proud of. This is actually the first National Marine Sanctuary that we've declared in 20 years, so we're really excited that Maryland is... Um, taken the action working with NOAA to make this a sanctuary. It's also the first sanctuary ever in the Chesapeake Bay uh, watershed too. So we really wanted to highlight the important value of this, this program. The other thing I just wanted to mention real briefly is uh, if you enjoy this evening, one of the things we do each year in June is have Capitol Hill Ocean Week. And we invite everybody that has a stake in the health of this planet to help work with us to prevent, uh, protect their place in it, and that is to come. It's an absolutely free conference where you get to kind of talk to um, world-renowned scientists, people in industry about the value of oceans and what they mean uh, t to us and what we can do to actually protect it. So I just wanted to make mention of that program tonight as well. Um, it's not too often. I get to wear a t-shirt to an evening event, and I'm very excited. One of the things that's happening today was we actually launched our brand new logo. And I'm gonna just show a really quick video um, that talks a little bit about it, but this program is so important because one of the things that we feel is, is, is critical to the conservation of our program is having people become stewards of our ocean. And we really want to invite people to work with us, to work with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to help protect these very special places. The wonders that lie beneath our protected waters are hard for most people to see. These marvels may exist out of reach of our daily lives, but they are ours. They are yours. The world's most pressing challenges are similarly difficult to see. These problems live beyond the clouds and beneath the surface. They are ours to overcome. 
Connected by currents, marine sanctuaries are the essential network of protected waters owned by every American. The National Marine Sanctuary Foundation invites people with a stake in the health of their planet to protect their own places in it. Our work extends from the ocean floor to Capitol Hill. We inspire, we connect, and we educate. Supporting marine sanctuaries connects us to our communities, our country, and our world. They fill those who know them with wonder. They beckon us to explore beyond our horizons. Join us in conserving our waters for the good of the world and everything in it. Thank you. So tonight we're gonna to invite you to discover the wonder of Chesapeake Bay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit of bit bio about our speakers today, have them come up. They're gonna do um, some brief remarks and then we'll go into moderated Q&A. And I really do encourage everyone to um, ask questions of the panel. This is a great panel that we're having tonight representing very different perspectives. And so I hope you'll take advantage of that. So the first person I want to, whoop, let me do this, invite up is Jack Cover, who's a general curator of living exhibits at the National Aquarium. He's a native of Baltimore, and so he's very familiar with the flora and fauna of the Chesapeake Bay. In his 25 years at the aquarium, Jack works as part of a team that provides people with an opportunity to get up close and personal with plants and animals from all over the world. And these experiences inspire them to value, respect, and protect all of these amazing animals. Uh, when Jack, is, when Jack is, isn't at the aquarium, he enjoys walking the trails around his home and with his family. So Jack, do you want to come on up? Our next speaker will be Genevieve LaRouche, who's a project leader with the Fish and Wildlife Service for the Chesapeake Bay Field Office. Throughout her career, Genevieve has held a number of roles with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She's also one of the founding members of the Greater Baltimore Wilderness Coalition, which aims to connect people to green spaces through equity, discovery, biodiversity, and resiliency. Genevieve, thank you. Our third speaker will be Sammy Orlando. And Sammy is the Chesapeake Bay Regional Coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Sammy has been with NOAA since 1983. And for the past 17 years, he's been with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, where he's been involved in place-based management. And for the past five years, Sammy has spearheaded um, efforts working with the communities around Mallows Bay to, pres um, to get the newly designated sanctuary. So Sammy, please come up and congratulations. Our final speaker of the evening is Susan Langley, and Susan is a Maryland State Underwater Archaeologist with the Maryland Historic Trust and the State Historic Preservation Office, a post that she's held for 24 years. She's held a number of teaching positions around the world, but most recently at St. Mary's College of Maryland and John Hopkins University. She serves on the Advisory Council for Underwater Archaeology, and she was recognized actually as a National Marine Sanctuary's volunteer Volunteer of the Year in 2015 for her incredible work um, with the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, which is right off the coast of North Carolina and actually our first designated National Marine Sanctuary. So Susan, thank you very much. So I'm gonna give you a uh, quick overview Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, the natural history of it. Okay, the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed or ecosystem is shown here. And so you see that the states aren't really caught out here because the states really don't mean anything to the ecosystem whatsoever. So why this um, blue line? Well, basically any rainfall that falls on this side of the blue line drains towards the Chesapeake Bay. So you're here in Western Maryland, Garrett County, Rains on this side, it's gonna go into the Ohio River drainage. Over here, it's gonna go into the Delaware Bay. So this vast ecosystem, um, and we're gonna go talk about pre-European settlement to really give you an idea how this thing worked when it was firing on all cylinders and most productive. So 
95% of that land mass was covered in forest um, before Europeans arrived, and probably down to about 55% forest at this point. But basically, you have all these um, rainfall going into the, the forest, into the soil, draining off, and um, sending a massive amount of uh, fresh water into the Chesapeake Bay. So you have all this fresh water coming down. Then you actually have salt water coming in, again, depending on the wind. So you have sort of the salt water wedge coming up. So you have all this salinity gradient. So you have about 3,600 plants and animals that live here because there's just a big diversity of habitats. Most of the, uh, almost 50% of the water coming from the Susquehanna, then the other 50% coming from the Potomac and these three rivers in Virginia. So you just, again, have this tremendous um, variety of habitats, some animals adapting to total fresh water. Um, and you have seasonal visitors. You have uh, basically animals that are here in the summer. You have residents. Then winter, you have the waterfowl coming down from the north. And uh, within this watershed, there's two species that actually can alter their environment to make big changes to it in the waterway. One is the beaver, which was actually extirpated here for its pelts. The other is us, um, Homo sapiens. So we uh, kind of came here, and we've been growing our population ever since. So we're 18 million now and, and growing. So um, the forest is just a key component of this habitat. You really can't separate the forest from the uh, bay. And here, the Chesapeake Bay watershed, Chesapeake Bay. You really have to take care of the forest. The forest, um, you know, again, when 95% of the covered rainfall would go, this is a temperate deciduous forest, so that water basically goes into all that leaf litter, which is like a bank. It holds the water. It filters the water. And so <clears throat> before we uh, removed a lot of this forest, basically even during the drought summertime, you would have water trickling out. So you had a more of a steady flow of water coming off the watershed. And not all, again, all that water doesn't get in. Some of that water is absorbed by the big trees and sent right back into the atmosphere. But Forests are absolutely a, a key component to the health of the ecosystem. So here you're on Savage River in Western Maryland. You see the water just flowing down, um, starting in little springs, going into first order streams, second order streams, then into rivers, eventually into the Chesapeake. So get to the next big ecosystem. This is the tidal salt marsh. <clears throat> so this is um, on the Nanticoke River, quite an extensive salt marsh. So here the land is getting flat. That water is slowing down. The settlements are coming out of it. And um, uh, the Baltimore journalist, H.L. Mencken, basically said that this was the great protein factory, the immense protein factory. This is the factory floor of the protein factory. Um, so sunlight is basically converted by these marsh grasses. Marsh is really a, a, a big grass meadow that floods twice a day with the, fly, with the tide. So, this is millions of microhabitats. So this is where we get our crabs. This is where our state reptile lives. And it really helps filter that water. So then you get out, and you, in the shallow water, you have these underwater grasses. So here you see a blue crab. Many of these animals, depending on the underwater grasses, which again sort of help sediments come out and help um, clear that water. Um, when you have too much algae and nutrient blooms, you don't get the sunlight down, and we lose. So we're seeing a resurgence of the underwater grasses. Um, then you go offshore and you start to see um, oysters. So oysters reefs at one time were a navigational hazard to the Europeans first coming up the bay. It was sort of the Chesapeake Bay's equivalent of the Great Barrier Reef. So you, you know you have them in the um, tidal areas, but really when you get out to 25 feet in subtidal, you just have this immense um, critter that basically self-perpetuates. Oysters spat, settle on oysters and grow. And each oyster can filter 50 gallons a day. And not only that, it's, it creates community. So there's one muscle, the hook muscle, that basically will live on this oyster shell that boosts that filtration by 50% more. So this is, again, another critical habitat. And uh, probably what helped you know, Baltimore. Baltimore was the oyster capital. Um, but unfortunately, again, and, and the oyster reefs are coming back. We have 1% left of what that original population was. So here's kind of what happens, and it's not always intentional, but you have um, ecological health high when the first low population as you go through. In Baltimore, we had industry and shipping, a lot of hard surfaces, and then we sort of have redevelopment. So the human impact, you can kind of start to affect that ecological health. 
so here's Baltimore, and you can see no more forest here. Um, you can see um, things on here, like um, over here we have the um, power plant. So we had coal being delivered that generated electricity. Um, so really um, a big change in the landscape that's affecting the ecological health. So this is Baltimore in uh, 1792, and you can see some little, at the Jones Falls, there's actually a little bit of salt marsh left. And so, again, people wanted to get a deep channel, get these piers out for shipping goods. So this is the current shoreline. So you can see what we did. We really filled it in this, um, and, and just altered it completely. And that's sort of our challenge nowadays um, with what we're going to do with the bay. So the um, National Aquarium has ambitious plans to sort of take this altered environment and bring back some of these habitats and floating wetlands. And so you could see we have this prototype floating wetland that we're uh, mimicking a lot of those habitats. And um, we actually see a lot of critters. One thing about the Chesapeake Bay is all these animals that come up into the Inner Harbor are the ones that came up here before there was any European settlement. So um, there's no sign at the Key Bridge that says, turn back water polluted. Um, so we really owe it to them to really help uh, bring back this environment. So this is our vision of where we want to be. So the prototype is testing a lot, but we really want to create this massive floating wetland with a, basically a big educational platform and bring the marsh to the people. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. When you think about special places in the Chesapeake Bay, what do you think about? You might think about eating crabs next to a river or the beach. You might think of kayakers paddling into the distance. Thomas Point Lighthouse in Annapolis, that's what I think about. Um, well, I'm here to talk about another kind of specialness, um, specialness that has to do with native wildlife and people and native Baltimoreans. Um, it's also a story about a place that was once like, discarded and trashed and, and we thought people forgot about. And it's a place that's now being you know, reborn that's, um, that has, I think we could even see the word redemption. Um, and it's a place that's really nearby. It's um, right across the harbor from us at Masonville Cove. And I'm gonna hear, talk a little bit about that story and the people working there. So here's an aerial overview, as we just heard from Jack. As we all know, Baltimore is very built out. Um, so uh, there we are at the Inner, inner Harbor. Um, here, there's Fort, Fort McHenry. There's Masonville Cove. This is the um, outfall of the Patapsco River, and I'll be talking more about that later. And uh, I just want you to note that these are the CSX railroad tracks. I'm going to be talking about that later that separate Masonville Cove from the neighborhoods of Curtis Bay and Brooklyn down here. Well, Masonville Cove wasn't always like that. Before the railroad tracks went in, this was a, a community with ample um, access to the Chesapeake Bay uh, with um, a thriving community. Masonville is named after Mr. Mason, a baker in the, air, in, uh, the neighborhood. And these people thrived on the fish, um, probably from, you know, for hundreds of years, if not longer, um, from the Patapsco River. Here's some more. This is a working class neighborhood. The people worked in shipbuilding and other areas, other types of commerce. Uh, when we opened up Masonville Cove to the public in 2012, I was lucky enough to meet a gentleman that had lived in this area before the railroads went in. And he told a story about how when he was a boy, he and some friends used to swim out to old World War II ships um, that were left out in the bay for a while and, and um, find World War II memorial um, memorandum, um, you know, souvenirs. I thought that was a pretty cool story. I have some, um, makes me think of like the fun adventures kids must have had back there then. Because we all know it's pretty hard to find a public places to access the water now in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so in addition um, to, you know, people being able to recreate there, it was a dumping ground for a long time. And along with that, some areas of it, and along with that, um, the water became polluted and fish started to die in the 1940s. And by the 1960s, the Patapsco River was effectively dead. 
And this stumping ground um, for old ships, they even found some old char charred remains when they were cleaning it up of beams that had burned down um, when Baltimore burned down in the early 1900s, one of the biggest fires in the United States there. And this stumping ground persisted until very recently. But what I, always, what I started learning about Masonville Cove, one story that really struck me is that there was a beer can trail going down to the water, even through the, all the dumping areas of all the overgrown vegetation. And those are beer cans nailed to a tree so people, the locals, could find their way down to the water to go fishing. And that, to me, that really showed how much people want to connect with the water, how important that is, how integral that is to us, that you, you, know, you go through those means to get there. Um, and, and I think um, maybe you could even say it's one of our redeeming qualities. Well, this all changed, and we're going to talk about the renaissance of Masonville Cove. And that was really through uh, one of the E's we talked about later, the economy and the port. And um, Port of Baltimore, ever since its founding, and today is a major port. I think it's the 14th biggest in the United States. And it needs to bring these huge ships in. I mean, those are really big ships. And to do that, they need to dredge the harbor and keep it clear to bring those ships up there. And they need a place to put the sand, to put the sediment. And one of those places is Masonville Cove. And some far-reaching, far-thinking people at the Port of Baltimore, his name was Frank Hammonds and others, wanted to do something for the public that had really been left behind in these industrial areas. So they asked the people in South Baltimore what they wanted. And what they said they wanted, they wanted an area where they could reconnect with water, where they could reconnect with nature, non-motorized access. So with that became the birth of Masonville Cove, a 70-acre nature sanctuary with a um, environmental Education Center operated by Living Classrooms Foundation. Because the port, as they would say themselves, they were not in the business of running refuges or um, nature er natural areas. They brought some innovative partners to help out. And that included the National Aquarium, Living Classrooms Foundation, the Greater Bay Brook Alliance, and later on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who I work for. Here we are. Uh, this is the opening, and in 20, uh, the, in 2012, or it was 20, yeah, 20, 2012, uh, Masonville Cove became the first urban wildlife refu refuge partnership in the country, and it's the first of 24 now. This is a phenomenon that um, Fish and Wildlife Service is working on nationwide, and Baltimore is seen as a leader, largely thanks to the work of our partners. Here's National Aquarium staff organizing a shoreline planting. In addition to the shoreline, the, um, everyone realized we needed to mitigate or take care of the naturally underwater resources, the fish. So the port placed through Maryland Environmental Services 2,000 reef balls. And we're starting to see some of the, 10 years later, we're starting to see the results of that. Here they are, here's some monitoring where they're staining for results. Here's a sunfish that they're um, just, they throw them back in the water, they just, you know, um, weigh them, et cetera, see, um, see how they're doing, measure them. And since in that 10 years, they've seen an increase in species, diversity, and number of fish. And it's starting to pay off to the public now. Here's the Fish and Wildlife Service, working with Living Classrooms Foundation and others on a fishing day for the public, taking some local kids out fishing. And the kids love it. They're so excited when they catch a fish. It's the best thing in the world to see. And along with the fish come the birds. We have our first nesting colony of birds in this part of Baltimore Harbor. I think it's the second only in the Chesapeake Bay that nests outside an old barge right off Masonville Cove. And that's because the fish habitat is so good. They're coming. <laughs> Hold your hook. You're ruining my punchline here. <laughs> um, this is an osprey um, that we tagged. Uh, we radio tagged some of these osprey, and we know some of them flew all the way down to Latin America. Oh. Did I miss it? Um, this is a bio blitz that Mason, um, that Masonville Cove, um, that we, that, we put out, that the National Aquarium puts on at Masonville Cove. And this is a great way that the aquarium and other partners are reaching people where they live. It's a way to get people to, the local people to connect with nearby nature. 
And at these bio blitzes, I think they've had three or four of them now. Um, this last one, they found more than 214 different kinds of species, which I think is just amazing within a short one day and a short time period. And what they do is they enter their data into apps like iNaturalist and eBird, and it's real science data that, that, we're, that we're using today to do planning. And in fact, in some of these, we're making some really great discoveries. For example, we found, uh, the results found six species of bees that we never knew to exist within um, Baltimore County, let alone Baltimore City. Oh, here's a picture of the osprey again. So we set up a webcam on these osprey um, so that people could see the live feed from the Nature Center so you could watch them anywhere um, in Masonville Cove. And, um, but they've recently been displaced by Canadian geese. So I guess we could blame Canada on that. Um, we are we're still working on that one. Stay posted. Um, here's a trash wheel that the port set up to catch some of the trash overflowing from the Tapsco River. Um, so uh, despite all this good work, the work continues. Volunteers, the port, um, the National Aquarium keep continuing to do good work, pick up the trash, help out where we can. Um, what one thing we're trying to do is improve access to Masonville Cove. Right now, you can't reach there unless by car. This is a map showing where we hope to put a bike trail that would connect Masonville Cove with the Inner Harbor, with Patapsco State Park. So there's a lot of work to be still that needs to be done. And ending on a note of hope, uh, Masonville Cove had its first nesting pair of bald eagles since the eagles were almost eradicated by DDT in the last century. So really excited. They decided to nest at Masonville Cove, which says a lot about how special it is. And here are the two eaglets that fl we successfully fledged. And if I don't know if that's not a special place, I don't know what it is. And I think it really talks to what you can do when you work with partners and you have a shared vision in mind and you're optimistic about the future. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out here tonight, and thank you to the National Aquarium and to the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation uh, for, for hosting this event tonight. I am Sammy Orlando, and it is an absolute pleasure not only to be here, but to follow up a good news story like that. And um, Chris previewed um, what will be another good news story in the next five minutes, and that is the telling of uh, our brand new National Marine Sanctuary at Mallows Bay, Potomac River, the first ever right here in the Chesapeake Bay. I know it's been said, I'll probably say it again, I never get tired of hearing that, so I just think it's that, that important. Um, okay, so I, I noticed um, there about 50% of you, by Chris's count, uh, that didn't know about National Marine Sanctuaries, so we'll give you the thumbnail. What are National Marine Sanctuaries? Well, they're America's underwater treasures. This is a network um, of special places in the marine, coastal, and Great Lakes environment, and they are, um, <clears throat> there are 14 of these, 14 National Marine Sanctuaries now, two marine national monuments. They cover about 600,000 square miles across the country, and they run from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico to the East Coast and out to the far Pacific. Um, they protect some of our nation's most treasured uh, underwater natural resources as well as our uh, maritime history and heritage. Um, if you're familiar with the natural resources, things like coral reefs, uh, kelp beds, marine mammals, seabirds, and on the natural, and on the um, <clears throat> history and heritage side, uh, shipwrecks are probably the most iconic uh, component of what we have. But when I talk about mallows, we'll see we broaden that definition to include other components of cultural and maritime history. Um, because of these great places, um, one of the spectacular and iconic uses of them is that they are, in fact, destinations. Um, these places, the Florida Keys, Monterey Bay, Stellwagen Bank at Cape Cod, these are iconic places uh, for people to go visit. So recreational uses of all types are allowed in National Marine Sanctuaries, and you see plenty of examples uh, of that there. Um, but <clears throat> recreation, as uh, prominent as it is, and in fact, recreation is so important in our sanctuaries, it's often said that sanctuaries are the economic engine for a lot of these coastal areas. They drive the blue economy. Uh, of these areas, but they're not the only use in this area. We have plenty of others uh, that to some degree have uh, either impact or have the potential to impact 
these sanctuary resources, both natural and, and heritage. And so our mandate, first and foremost, centers on resource protection. And there are lots of different ways to get there. But our mandate's also equally as clear that says we have to facilitate uses that are compatible with the primary mission of natural resource protection. So to some degree, we rely on, we rely on uh, regulations and, and rules. Got it, got to have them in some places. But to a large degree, what we really rely on is a lot of these non-regulatory programs, education, outreach, interpretation, science, uh, and the like that we use to raise public awareness and ultimately change behavior and to build that stewardship ethic. So that brings us to our newest success stories, Mallows Bay, Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary. Um, this is something that was brought to NOAA. NOAA opened up a process about five years ago. They asked communities. They didn't come in top down, federal down, but they asked communities instead, bottom up, where do you have some special places of national significance, either natural resources or heritage resources that you want us to consider as a natural marine sanctuary? And the community here in the Chesapeake Bay was, was absolutely ready to roll. And they organized themselves, a broad coalition, diverse constituent groups. They came in really hot and very quick with this nomination for Mallows Bay. They wanted a maritime heritage site. They wanted something that was in the, obviously in the Chesapeake Bay, and they wanted to promote recreation. We went through an, an extremely extensive public process that lasted for five years, lots of scoping meetings, lots of programming, uh, and the like, and we finally ended up with these 18 square miles that you see here in the middle of the Potomac River. Um, it is, in fact, a maritime heritage site focused on uh, the ghost fleet, the, the remains of the World War I era uh, vessels. Um, no natural resource management uh, is done in this particular area. So when people go out to visit Nat, um, Amalas Bay, they see the remains of the ghost fleet. So the ghost fleet is kind of a, a nickname for the remains of over 100 World War I era wooden steamships that are in this part of the Potomac River uh, adjacent to Ch uh, Charles County, Maryland. But the real story behind them is how they were built. This was an engine, an economic, a societal engine uh, for this country. We were, we were not a shipbuilding nation. 40 shipyards, 17 states were involved in building these uh, ships. It really galvanized the country and kind of brought about a change in the way we do business. And although merchant mariners get a lot of play in World War II, this really was the blossoming of, of that group. You build that many ships, you need people to build them, to run them, uh, and to maintain them. Um, but once we got going on trying to interpret Mallows Bay, it soon became a, a lot more beyond the ghost fleet. We learned, for example, that this place in the Chesapeake goes back 10 to 12,000 years and dates back to the American Indians. The Piscataway Kanoi Indian tribe is one of three state recognized tribes in this region and they're very proud to be part of the sanctuary and to work alongside of us for interpret interpretation. Uh, up on the upper right, uh, the Waterman community, commercial uh, watermen. They've been part of this area for the better part of three or four hundred years. The Potomac River was one of the premier commercial fishing sites. In fact, was um, actually brought to you sturgeon and caviar processing uh, that for very few people know about. Their legacy and their heritage is something we want to interpret. DOD, four different facilities along the Potomac River have been there 160 years. They are, in fact, a way that people interact with the coastal uh, environment. And again, part of the history and heritage that we're celebrating. So one of the ways that we do this is we bring people out there and we give them a map, a laminated map, go out there and kayak, and we begin to tell them some of these interpretive stories. This is one tool to arm them. Um, it's been brought to you in partnership with a gazillion partners. It would take me the rest of the night to tell you about all the people that have been involved the last five years that I can't thank profusely enough, but this is one of the ways we tell them about it. So my invite to you and my closing slide is I really invite all of you to get out there, experience the sanctuary, feel the spirit of this special place and know why it's the backyard of the Chesapeake Bay that I want all of you to come and visit.
now for something completely different. Not quite so different. We work with Sammy and, and um, the state has, um, as the um, State Historic Preservation Office, we are involved also with Mallows and uh, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I thought I'd start uh, just sort of a reminder comparing uh, John Smith's map to what it looks like today and how much of our, our uh, coastline has gone underwater so you have an idea of both prehistoric, historic, and natural resources that are now underwater. And of course, some of these are, are, you know, we remember a little bit, maybe not ourselves, but this is Point Lookout, and this is the Prisoner of War Camp and the Hammond Hospital, and, and you can see the outline of what's left. Um, the shaded area, of course, here is, this is what exists now, and how much of that is out in the water. Um, area, lots for me to do. Uh, this is the, um, <laughs> I didn't put Poplar Island in, but I'm sure some of you remember that going away and now coming back. Um, as a uh, new, um, we're not allowed to call it dredge spoil, um, uh, dredge material repository, uh, but also for birds, which I expect to have four eyes and three wings and whatever, like on The Simpsons. Uh, 20, uh, 2010, we watched the last house on Hodlin Island go under, so we do have cultural resources fading on us, you know, even within our, our memories. Um, Maryland is... One of the state, I'm very proud to, to work here because we can stand toe to toe with major states like California in managing climate change. We have an action plan. We are studying what's happening, what's going to happen, and areas we need to be concerned about and where we have um, coastal resources at risk. And archaeologically, they always get angry. I put the A back in. I don't know, my office hates the A. They're a very odd bunch. They can't spell archaeology correctly. Um, but we have, uh, it, it gives you a sense of how many sites we've inventoried, how many exist, how many are eroding, the nature of those, the Paleo-Indian, the very earliest sites uh, are very much at risk, contact period, all of these sites that are either partially submerged or, you know, heading that way, you can see the shell midden eroding out. Um, we do try and, and study these. We appreciate it when citizens get hold of us and, and you know, contact us about eroding sites they're aware of and want to do um, recording or site forms. Obviously, as a state entity, we're not allowed on private property without an invite. My territory is the uh, mean high tide line and down, and in, on the Potomac, it's the low, high, uh, uh, low tide mark in Virginia and down. But things we have to look at, this is Isabel, 2003, and in downtown Annapolis, People kept saying to me, you're underwater archaeologist, get in there. I'm like, I know where storm sewers come from, not me. Uh, but we do have situations like this, what they used to call nuisance flooding. Four instances a year. Over the last 15 years, it's now 4-0, four 40 instances a year. It's no longer nuisance flooding. This is now a chronic issue. And we do look at it. Some of you may remember last summer the amount of um, marine debris that washed up. It actually ended the, um, the Governor's Cup race because there was so much floating around that was a hazard. This is downtown Annapolis. Uh, it is a concern, of course. And we have professionals removing pieces. We have volunteers removing pieces. This concerns me greatly because they don't know the difference. In this picture is a modern piece and a historic piece. They don't know. This is somebody's wharf. This is a World War I shipwreck. They just lodged together. So we are working with EPA and uh, National Park Service to come up with a training program, not just for the public, but of course public are welcome, but for, the, for other uh, state entities and uh, professionals as well who don't always know what's happening. Um, this is another thing I don't want volunteers helping me with. We do get ordinance and some of it is still live. This is Civil War ordinance. We had five of them and they are still, you know, they had to be blown up and they love doing that. They blowed up real good. They come and tell me about it. But we have some that aren't, but I, I don't want people making that. Please don't bring it to me. Bring me to it. Uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> I showed you that one already. Um, this is uh, uh, what we've been putting out at the Maryland Historical Trust. We often deal with, with uh, state to state or state agencies. We put out with NOAA, and this is a nationwide endeavor, how to handle marine debris. And this was all our agencies, the Coast Guard, public sector. We've also put one out for communities and local governments on how to deal with historic building flooding. And the uh, far one is not quite done yet, but I did write the public outreach section. And I'm saying, bring people in while we're, while we're doing teaching ourselves, while we're teaching cities. If you have issues with flooding, let us know. We will help you with this. Um, we also work with the Coast Guard, um, Homeland Security, for uh, an area contingency plan for oil and hazmat spills. I got wind of this early on, and we've been working with them 20 years. So they came to us when they said, we want to develop a program for all state agencies because in other states. They said, most states don't know. They have an obligation to be looking at this stuff. 
We've actually had states tell us we don't have any water. And I'm like, you've got a major international seaport. Oh. Yeah, so we, we, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years. They love us, but this is Chalk Point oil spill. We do work with them on this stuff. Uh, we don't want to see the you know, um, number 10 Boy Scout troops standing in carcinogenic oil. We, we have roles for volunteers. Call me. We'll find you a job. You can rub ducks or whatever, but don't get in the oil. Um, I do work with volunteers all over the place, and I, I don't have a lot of time, so please come and find me. I'm happy to find something for you to do. Believe me, I've got lots for you to do. These are volunteers who worked on the U-1105, which is a German U-boat. It's uh, rubber-coated. It was early effort at stealth technology. One of our volunteers has written a book about it. There's flyers outside in a brochure. We're going to have a free lecture at my office on October 15th. He'll be signing copies. There will be, I promise you, film footage the public hasn't seen before. It is a submarine. It can't be that exciting, but come anyway. Um, we have the Inter um, um, uh, Institute of Maritime History look after it for me. We teach classes. We do offer programs for remote sensing to teach folks how to find sites for us. You don't have to know all this fancy math. That's why I hire these guys. They set my VCR. Remember, that's how old I am, VCR. Um, and they, you know, we set this up. Uh, actually, I do still do it, but my assistant does more of it. But we're happy to teach classes and find you stuff to do. Um, we have a workshop every year. It's usually mid-March. We give Volunteer of the Year awards. That's Donald Chomet, who was one of the maritime authors for Maryland, big time. Uh, that we have a, that's our workshop program. We do put out a booklet. April is Archaeology Month every year. There's lots of stuff happening. We worked with, uh, of course, NOAA and um, uh, Chesapeake Conservancy and DNR to put out these wonderful waterproof paddling maps. Sammy and I live at Mallows Bay. They think he's my brother. Uh, we're just down there all the time. And we do the trash cleanup, which he didn't mention, but we've been, what, eight of them now? Something like that, eight or nine. Um, I have students who are master students who are coming up on rec tagging programs. We tag them with QR codes, and we've tracked them as far as North Carolina. We want people to come out, do our classes, and go out for a family fun event in Ocean City and tag rec pieces for us. And then we can track them online. We'll send you something wonderful if you find pieces, you know. Well, I'll give you a prize. It will be a cool floating keychain, I promise. We work with high schools, uh, the NOAA's Ocean Guardian program. 33 schools do Ocean Guardian. Only three of them are east of the Mississippi, and two of them are in Charles County, an elementary and a high school. So yeah, if you're a teacher, we have something for you to do. And this is where I want to end it. Um, this is just a, if you've been going over the, the Key Bridge, you've noticed Fort Carroll. Um, here's what it looked like in 1928. Here's what it looks like in 2016. Um, there's a wonderful Outdoors Maryland DNR uh, video. It actually won an Emmy called Colonel Lee's Birdhouse. It runs every now and then. This is a privately owned structure. It, um, the Park Service had the chance to buy it when they bought Fort McHenry and turned it down. The family that owns it has leased it several times to various entities that thought they could do something. God help us, like a casino. Um, there's a few problems with like, uh, you know, sewers, garbage disposal, but it is turning into an aviary. It, it is a wonderful birdhouse. Uh, problem is all the bushes and things are pushing the uh, historic structure apart. But the family who owns it, they live in, um, the Eisenbergs live in Potomac. Um, I'd love to see us, that's my new bugboo, this and, and uh, Curtis Bay. I want to do kayaking around Curtis Bay. We have 18 Mallows vessels up there, plus some other really interesting vessels. Talk to me later. Um, but this is my, my new bugboo. I I want to see us do something really cool with this. But if you get a chance on MPT to watch Colonel Lee's Birdhouse, do it. You'll enjoy it thoroughly. It's half an hour. Thanks very much. One of the reasons tonight, you might, might have noticed, we kind of have half of our panel talking about the natural history side of the equation and, and the other half talking about the cultural history. And in the Chesapeake, that is a really combined history, um, both from the past, but also going forward in the future, I think, as Susan has pointed out with um, climate change and other things happening. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're living in kind of futures past right now, and how we think about preservation and conservation and the route forward kind of matters to, to future generations. So let me um, just ask a, a question. Um, uh, Genevieve, this was the first time the Fish and Wildlife Service decided to look at an urban wildlife refuge. Often they are in areas that are more remote. They're protecting ducks for hunting or for other purposes. So why was it important to invest here? Why was it important to look at what was a contaminated 
watershed area and say we actually want to make the investment to restore this particular area? Um, thank you for that question. I'm glad my mic is working. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service realized it's, it wasn't just nationally without going into the Baltimore specific example. It wasn't if we want to be a relevant conservation agency and have people understand wildlife and really connect with it and want to vote for it and be conservationists, they need to give something people something tangible. It can't just be on TV. Um, it can't just be about um, you know wildlife and other continents. But we need to connect them, connect them with um, their conservation issues and their wildlife nearby, including high quality wildlife like eagles and ospreys and, and native wildlife. So um, when we um, when Masonville Cove um, had such a vibrant partnership there and so many people already working at it that were willing to work with us, that wanted to, that needed our expertise. We had some visitor services expertise. We had wildlife management expertise. They brought lots of other good traits to the table that we didn't have. It just seemed like a natural partnership. And then the rest of um, my leadership agreed that that was a really good place to invest our time in. And, um, and we've been rewarded in many ways by, um, it's, my staff is extremely busy. We're very understaffed, but it's our favorite thing to do is to work on Masonville Cove and to visit and go to the events there. Great. And Jack, the National Aquarium is a big partner in that. So you haven't just kind of stayed within these walls in terms of looking at the conservation, showing people the beauty of the underwater environment and, and protecting it. You've actually been going out to the, the community. A similar question, why is the National Aquarium deciding that they want to work on these urban areas and restoration in these areas? Well, again, I think the um, Maceville Cove is, when you look at where it's positioned, at the, where the Patapsco comes out, we just look at these little pockets and, you know, wildlife has to have these stopovers and, you know, places where, you know, it, we can have wildlife and we can have people. And so if you look at the history, I sort of look at dumping ground and now it's, you know, basically coming back for those neighborhoods. and. So we do bioblitz out there, and I can tell you the neighborhood shows up, and people have a, just a wonderful time. So there's really nothing like um, getting out and, and sort of, um, particularly in these urban areas, and you're, you're amazed at what you see there. Um, just, and again, seeing, seeing the eagles there and ospreys back. We see ospreys in the inner harbor here. So we really can not sort of separate um, urban areas and just basically say, this is where people are, this is where nature is. We have animals migrating through here. And so I think it was, again, it's very close by. It, um, our staff really um, has had a, you know, a great um, time out there planting grasses and just seeing you know, the results of what, and, and very excited that every time we go out there in June to find new species. So it's um, just a hands-on experience and you think about people in those neighborhoods that would go down to the water fish, we're just trying to get back to that point where that waterfront is not a dumping ground, but it's just a great place for learning about nature and recreation. Great. So everybody tonight talked about the importance of kind of community-based conservation or community engagement in terms of, of the, the, the work that was going on. Sammy, you talked about how NOAA started a process with rather than top-down conservation of sanctuaries, it was a very kind of bottom-up approach about where did people want to protect um, these areas? So I'd like the panelists to just reflect on like, how, how do you go about both engaging communities but also keep them engaged over the long term? So it's not just about designating a site or protecting a site, but keeping that community involvement throughout and kind of keeping the public um, education and outreach going. I'll start, yeah. that's okay. Um, I, I think in a word, it's probably uh, uh, diversity. Um, I think for uh, Mallows Bay in particular, um, I have found that the cultural component of the sanctuary is something that is relatively new uh, to the people. Sanctuaries a lot of times are people's backyards. A lot of them have grown up around there. Um, a lot of them may have visited there, but they really to a large degree haven't adopted them. They haven't tried to own them. Um, and a lot of people who have a, a, a strong environmental background, they'll probably be your, your first adopters. They'll be the first ones out there. But what we found with the maritime heritage 
is that this is about people, and people are really interested in people. They're interested in generations of people um, of, of all different sorts. And so in terms of grabbing people initially for an opportunity like a National Marine Sanctuary, um, it was really imperative that it wasn't exclusively about the environment, to diversify and talk about Native Americans, to talk about the uh, commercial fishing industry, to talk about generations of families that were part of the shipbreaking process at Mallows Bay uh, over time are things that really connect to, to everyday people. So these sanctuaries become living laboratories for people to even explore their own lineage in a lot of different ways and find out things about themselves. Um, we, find our, we find sanctuaries too attract again, a diverse group of people. We have artists uh, that come out there, they just, they want to paint. Um, and that's really exciting to us because we don't necessarily go out and try to exclusively find them, they find us. And so the national brand and coming at it from a different angle, I think helps attract and then sustain because there's no shortage of ways to kind of come at the cultural component and the people component uh, going forward. And if I can steal a page from Sammy's book um, and lean on Mallows for a moment. Um, it's a national marine sanctuary for a reason. He mentioned how these vessels were built all over the country. Well, there are descendant communities of those shipbuilders all over the country. And we're actually hearing from other states now asking about specific vessels that were built in their state and are now at Mallows. And there are people who great grandpa worked in the shipyard or maybe he was a lumberjack or a sawyer or a miner that they had a role in this and that's why we keep saying you're all stakeholders it's national for a reason come on over um there's also a, there are other vessels in there too that you know I, I was saying the other day you know, come for the world war one fleet but stay for the other stories and there's a, a vessel there that showed up in the 70s and it's a ferry and we kind of Frankly, we're dissing it. It's like we're bemoaning the fact we had, you know, we couldn't go to our World War One primary sources and we couldn't go to these other primary sources, and then we started hearing about people who had gotten engaged on that ferry and they came back on their anniversary to paddle it. People who had sailed it when they were, you know, we're like, oh my God, we're missing a primary community now that we're on this later vessel. So Sammy's been looking into getting the equipment. We're trying to find people who can do good oral histories and engage the communities now who are descendant communities of either the shipbreakers, like you mentioned, or across the country, or who may have still be alive and remember some of the more recent vessels in there. So trying to do oral history is a big deal. And I'm not qualified for it, but we've got to try and find people who are. Um, just, I could add on to the, the theme of, of diversity and, and looking in places we wouldn't normally, um, or at least Fish and Wildlife Service hadn't normally thought about. Um, one, um, we are working with Hispanic Access Foundation, and they're tapping into some of the community um, Spanish-speaking churches, and um, it turns out that they have an affinity for monarch butterflies and, um, and for migratory birds, just like we do. And uh, we've been working with youth groups, the National Aquarium has, and to bring out people to have um, um, at Latino, Hispanic days out at Masonville Cove and, make them, and have them realize that this is a place that they can visit too and become theirs. Um, and also, I think, you know, along with that, um, trying to have a wide breadth and a, and a wide way of thinking about um, how to... Um, how people connect with um, nature and with the special places. I think we need to think about, um, you know, people who are real opinion leaders and thought leaders. Like I was speaking with Rodette Jones here, who's in the audience somewhere. Where's Rodette? Oh, there she is. So she's got all kinds of innovative things going on in, in nearby um, an area right nearby um, Filbert Street Garden to Masonville Cove, such as goats and beekeeping and things I had no idea was going on. And I think in staying like tuned into thought leaders like her, influential people like her, keeps places like Masonville Cove relevant. Yeah, and I think that, um, I mean, the biggest thing with these community-based areas, again, is just pride in that area. And, and, and what we have found when our staff go out, many community members just basically say, thanks for thinking about us. Um, we really are, um, you know, very happy that we're um, being included in this, but it's just really accessibility. Um, it's close by, you don't have to get in your car and drive five hours or six hours. You, these places are close by. It's, um, again, a lot of activities for your kids, and I just, again, keep thinking about when we were doing the Bio Blitz, all these kids running around butterfly nets just for the first time, you know, finding these things that are very, very close by, and 
getting very excited to hear about them. So it's, um, I think that accessibility is really important. Great, I got some great questions from the audience. Can, oh, go can ahead. I just throw in, um, I'm so happy you mentioned Filbert Street because um, I'm a beekeeper and we were, he, they came and spoke to our organization and I volunteered at the county fair the other day and there were representatives from the women's shelter and this, this whole area, this, that started with one or two things and, and I remember when Masonville was like a cesspit and I was with the Coast Guard and we were looking at the oil on it going, oh my God, and how it's turned around and it's, as you, like you said, it's a community begets community and now all these other, entities have come up in that area and they're all coming out between Masonville and Filbert Street and all of these whether it's beekeeping or um, women's shelters and they're, they're actually doing bee products as well and it, it, it's astounding to see how this one section of, of Baltimore is really coming back and it's uh, largely based on you know the culture and the nature together. That's great. So here's some questions for the audience. Um, big picture question here. What's your vision for a thriving Chesapeake Bay watershed? This is to everyone. Well, we stumped them. Well, again, I think that um, you look at the the size of that, and, um, and oftentimes you see, you know, basically individuals feeling kind of helpless. But you know, you, this misconception that there's people and there's nature. You know, we are part of that ecosystem. And so oftentimes you're sort of bombarded with it's hopeless, it's whatever. It's not really the case. And I, again, I look at the resilience of, um, of a forest. I mean, you could take a city block in Baltimore City and take away the hard surface and plant native vegetation and it'll, you know, things will get down into the soil. So it's, it's very resilient. And I think that, again, it's that balance of trying to, uh, rather than having things continually degrade, it's really, um, you know, looking at um, all these habitats, all this connection, and um, it's it's doable. And I think the um, you know the other part about it is just again you just you look at all the stuff going on with oysters now. We sort of I wish we had a redo on that Im immense uh, oyster reef that was out there, but we're now starting to look at more an oyster restaurant. So you, can, so you can basically have um, harvesting of natural resources, but not diminishing them. You just have to be very smart about doing that. But I just, again, I, I look at it as like, you know, basically you, you saw the, um, all the main license plates, uh, treasure the Chesapeake, now I'm seeing one that says um, protect the Chesapeake, and so we need to have the next one being restore the Chesapeake. And it's just basically, I think, again, all these community groups really looking, you look at stormwater management, all this thing, there's so much new innovation out there that can correct some of these problems. Um, so we just need to implement them. And just, um, I shared that vision too, and I think we can use technology to figure out where we've gone too long and where we've gotten to the tipping points. And again, it's going to be starting from the ground up, like we've, like we've talked about here, working with these small communities, working with organizations with shared goals, little by little. And the ecosystem is resilient. It can bounce back. And my vision is where we could all go swimming off Masonville Cove and eat the fish that we catch. Great. Yeah, <clears throat> add, on, add on to that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, people ask that question, you know, when, when, is, the, when is the bay going to be restored? And some people will, you know, harken back to the, to, the, to the John Smith days. And that probably isn't realistic. Um, shifting baselines, we talked about the forestation going from 95% down to 55% right now. Um, but so what ends up happening a lot of times we find uh, with sanctuaries that, is that the problem is just almost intractable. People just look at it and it's overwhelming. And so what happens in places like Masonville Cove, like in National Marine Sanctuaries, you find these little hope spots. And these are the places that really connect to people. These are their backyards. These are what people care about. And if you can find a way, and it's not, there's no one straight line, no one way to do it, but if you can find a way to connect people to these hope spots, they find a way to actually make change in their backyard. And that change that's positive begets new change. And that's why we're real, really excited about some of these success stories that are going on all over the Chesapeake Bay region. And we're hoping that bringing in National Marine Sanctuary with its brand provides yet another one of these opportunities to connect people who you know, want to be connected but don't know how or the problem is too big. And, and so please come out and join any or all that you've been hearing about um, and help make a difference in, in your own backyard. 
Yeah, I think it's the in investing wisely and knowing where to invest. And it's it's sort of, there, as you say, there are areas that are at the tipping point. And, um, you know, we had um, a park service example at a conference I went to where they, they went to a, an area that they knew was going to suffer from sea level rise and whatever. But they, um, they hadn't realized how much. And they looked at the structures and they said, well, this one is going to take the least amount of money to restore to its to how it's pristine state. So they did that. But it was also the first one to succumb to sea level rise. So it's like, we should have done the one that costs more but would last longer. And it's sort of lessons learned. So where we can invest in a, in a, um, a, a fruitful and, and successful way we should. There are places, I, I can't remember if it's North or South Carolina, one of the universities is wor working on migrating um, plants upstream from areas where, where as the sea encroaches and sort of developing these gardens along little waterways. And those are the kinds of things where we may have success stories where, as you say, in your backyard where you can do this. But overall, on some big ones, I often look at some of our maps, especially for the Lower Eastern Shore, and go, if you want your kids to have waterfront, buy in the middle of Wicomico County now. And I, I mean, there are areas where you really, you can't do anything or you can't do a lot. So where do you put your money? Put your money where it will, it will have the best return. And and these may well be the ways to do that. Just going to pause for a question because our a term keeps coming up, and I think it might be helpful for people to hear from you about how you think of what does it mean to restore the environment? So, because we've used it quite a bit, and it can mean a lot of different things to different people. Sammy, you kind of mentioned some people think of restoration as going all the way back to John Smith. Um, which is a little difficult, especially in the Chesapeake. So when we talk about restore, and maybe this is appropriate for John and, and Genevieve, what do you guys look to as, as natural resource managers for what that means? Um, to me, it means to restore so that the ecosystem is functioning to a point where we can sustain the species that we're trying to, that we're looking at as indicative of other species in that niche. So if we restore an area such that bald eagles can thrive, we hope a lot of the other birds that depend on the same habitats would also thrive. Got it. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna add, um, President Johnson referred to the Potomac back in the 60s as the nation's river, and it was it was a cesspool. And I think that you're looking at people like Bernie Fowler who does his wade in every year and says that when I was a kid I could see my sneakers. So every year he measures how far he can wade into the Patuxent and still see his sneakers. And he says it's improving. So this is a good thing. <laughs> but when, when I first went to Mallows Bay 25 years ago, there were maybe three eagles and we now have seven breeding pair. And I think things like that do speak to restoration. They do speak to the health of the river. So calling it the nation's river now, is, it, it, it means a lot more than it did perhaps in 1965. But we are seeing things coming back, and how you measure it, whether it's by seeing your sneakers or seeing more viable species or being able to swim off Masonville or eat the fish you catch. Um, I think that that's sort of, that's restoration as far as I'm concerned, when you can take it back to a level that, as you said, it functions and you can actually do things you used to do in it. Thanks. So that's a good measure, and especially from a human perspective about how to think about it. So let me uh, combine two questions here, which I, I love these. So. What are some of your most memorable conversations about the Chesapeake Bay, and what kind of gives you hope for the Chesapeake Bay? Is there a story or? I have to say, Susan, I liked your story about the, the people that were now tied to place between because of all the, the ships that were there, including people that got engaged on the ferry and things like that. But what are, what are those stories? What gives you hope? And, what are, the, what are the, the stories you like to tell family and friends about what you see happening in the Chesapeake Bay? You guys are asking really good questions. I keep stumping the panelists here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I would say <clears throat> that, it's, um, that I have a story to tell about it, but what does give me hope is we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of work um, in, in, in classrooms and um, a lot of educational programs. And we try to connect a lot of students, again, along the Potomac River in this particular case, that have lived there. And what's just absolutely stunning to me is that you ask the, a student body who's actually been to the Potomac River, and just a small subset of hands go up in the air. This is, this is where you live. They just don't go to the river. They don't have an affinity or even a, a, a family connection that they know of um, to the Chesapeake Bay. And we're doing a lot of work, and one that I'm calling out you know, by name here, 
we work a lot with the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. And this is a program that we've had uh, for the last about three years that we've been connecting high school students and students who quite honestly are afraid of getting into the swimming pools, uh, let alone getting out into the Potomac River and actually doing things that have a stewardship ethic that one day would help the Chesapeake Bay. But what we're finding, and Susan has been part of this alongside of us, is that these students come alive to have these new opportunities be taught about, about science in a different kind of way from a cultural perspective to actually put on that mask and get into the swimming pool and take the first breath underwater. And what comes out of that is this sense of belief in self. And every time I sit at the edge of the pool and I watch these students come out, this sense of accomplishment, this sense of belief, this sense of what comes next. And you don't know where that goes really when you're doing these things, but you do hear the students talk about wanting to get out in the river. They want to do more for the Chesapeake Bay. They want to go into diving and they want to do things that are going to be helping the environment. And all this comes from this spark of energy and the self of belief um, that we hope one day will translate into, again, a, a passion for caring about the Chesapeake Bay. So that's inspirational to me. I never turned down the opportunity to go down there and watch this firsthand because it really is almost emotional to watch because you know you really are making a difference toward, I think, the goals that we all believe in. So I think one thing um, for our staff is we have our floating wetland between um, piers three and four. So we're out there planting Spartina grass or working on the island and we sometimes have more conversations and we actually can't get work done. but. Um, we just have everybody coming along, and first of all, there's this misconception that the inner harbor of Baltimore is lifeless. So we you know, basically have recreated some of these things. There'll be a big school of Silversides or Medhaden filter feeding going by or striped bass, and they're just amazed. They're like, there's, there's living things in the inner harbor, um, and you have all kinds of ranges of you know, older folks talking about their memories, but just sort of walking them through of where Baltimore used to be, that this was all the native stuff here. And um, for them to look down and see it coming across that pedestrian bridge, it's absolutely wonderful that um, they're discovering it and they're finding out, you know, there is actually a lot of life in the Inner Harbor. So follow-up question, um, what can individuals do to help protect the Chesapeake Bay? I would say get involved. There's so many places you could you can do that. You know, it's here with the National Aquarium with all the local work they're doing in South Baltimore with partners, they're planting local pollinator gardens, they're they're writing grants, they're finding out what the community needs are and working from there. You could do it on a small level, uh, write you could write letters to support conservation, you could do it on a bigger level. Um, you know, I think we have to remember that this is a really resilient ecosystem, and that there, uh, and and to and to not lose hope, and that we can, it, we that our actions as Masonville Cove and all these other um, examples up here demonstrate um, that 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 um, a lot of good can come out of um, putting our minds to things. Yeah, I think the first thing is to not get discouraged. Not um, sometimes you, there's a lot of noise out there that it's hopeless, and you look at that. Just be a watershed and you think, what can me as an individual do? Well, you know, you can, in your own backyard, um, Americans have this obsession with lawns, which kind of came over from England. Um, lawns certainly are better than a asphalt parking lot, but there's things you can do in your backyard and you just think about your, you know, your leisure time. You know, I can either start to transform this property into, um, you know, basically rain gardens and see birds or I can put gasoline in this mower and spend all Saturday cutting this grass, fertilizing it. We just have bad habits. And so um, it's, and if you're in the city, I mean, there's, again, the, probably the single most cost-effective thing you can do to help the water quality of Chesapeake Bay is just plant a tree. If you're um, into going out with community groups, um, just think about, you know, joining that group. And then I would I would encourage you, once you've gone in and planted Go back to it. I mean, we've gone back to some things um, like um, different marshes that we planted the grass, and you go in and you can't tell what was the planted and what's the natural habitat, and you just see 
you know, fiddler crabs, all these things in there that um, and you're just like, yeah, you know, this can be done. And so it really is a matter of um, figuring what will work for you. And it could be, you know, simply just, you know, planting, even if you're in the city on your, uh, you know, you have a balcony, every plant out there is going to absorb carbon. And so it's just, again, trying to think about what that bay used to be and try to mimic it as best you can. Um, that really was a perfect answer, but if, you know, every April we hear about Earth Day and there's always you know, big cleanups, clean up the Potomac, clean up various tributaries, um, and you can get into any group, there's scout groups or church groups, and you can adopt an area, but I, I think that was the perfect answer on what you can do on your own is just look in your own backyard and decide what you can and can't do, um, but there, there are lots of groups out there, and it doesn't have to just be in April, it doesn't have to just be on Earth Day, you can do this stuff all year. I'm going to add just a couple of things, if you guys don't mind. One is, with the watershed approach, I think what John mentioned is really important. Never forget, though, also reuse, recycle, um, reduce is very important, because that's the things that are entering the watershed. Um, one of the th things Susan hit on is obviously the impacts of climate change and how we're seeing sea level rise impact a lot of resources. So reducing carbon emissions is still going to be very key to the efforts. And probably one of the biggest things right now affecting biodiversity in our oceans is actually overfishing. So always looking for sustainably sourced seafood is actually another really key step. All, all of these are actually individual actions that taken collectively can have really huge impacts for our environment. So just add a couple of other things there as well. So a couple more questions from the audience. Um, Susan, what do we know about the earlier human cultures and their impacts on the Chesapeake? Oh, well, if you're talking about oystering, it was a disaster, of course, um, but, but it wasn't always a local disaster. What happened was we actually had, um, the, the Maryland was trying to sustain their oyster fisheries and not allow steam dredging and whatnot, but steam dredgers came in, sometimes with falsified records from other states, and of course, once somebody's doing it and you're seeing them making a profit and you're not, um, we ended up with a lot of overfishing during the late 1800s, 1888, that area. Um, and that was, that was a big impact, of course. And when the fish, they're reduced, we've lost our biggest filtration when we lose the oysters and we start getting you know, a lot more um, buildup of what well, we're still getting a lot more siltation. The other thing that shocked me, I, I didn't realize, was that Maryland, well, a lot of places in the States, but Maryland specifically did not adopt contour plowing until the 1930s. Um, we always thought that was kind of a no-brainer, but it went right back to the feudal system of you plowed your little narrow strip perpendicular to the river, and of course every time it rained, your silt ran in, and that happened from earliest colonial settlement up until the 1930s, and that, when you don't have enough oysters filtering or anything else, we end up with that enormous siltation. That's what created this very shallow estuary that we're on, and then of course diseases coming in from elsewhere, which, you know, whether we can control them or not, I'm not sure, but didn't do the oysters any any good. So um, unfortunately, we have had impacts since the earliest time. Um, native impacts, yes, they were there. They actually, when the settlers arrived, they said, wow, we could actually drive a, a you know, four-horse carriage through the trees here because they'd been farming and they'd cleared trees and it was very much a meadow situation. But it was a managed and sustainable one. It was once we get sort of carried away and start using European methods in a new area that we started losing a lot of... Um, of, of turf to, to uh, silt runoff and whatnot, and then overfishing as well. So yes, we had an impact from earliest times. Let me follow up with a question since you mentioned oysters. The Chesapeake Bay has designated oyster sanctuaries to bring back the species. Should we open sanctuaries to harvest or keep them protected? Not sure if we have a, somebody on that one that can answer. Well, again, um, you can't take the whole question, can we have our oysters and eat them too, is basically the, the question. <laughs> um, you can't take out more oysters from the bay than Mother Nature can produce. So um, unfortunately with every fishery, and you think about um, Native Americans harvesting oysters, probably people wading in water, breaking off some oysters, putting them on a fire. With every fishery, human technology increases the efficiency. So eventually you were inventing rakes, then we're inventing tongs, then hydraulic, um, basically, dredges. And so we, unfortunately, have just been so efficient removing those oysters. And we know now that the oysters really need to stay in there for their ecological value. I mean, you think about other fisheries, 
like striped bass, I mean, they forage on these oyster reefs. So you're going to help basically oysters, but you really need to, to, to leave that three dimensional structure in there. And you have to leave enough oysters so that you can have a good spawn. Um, we are now, through technology, shifting a lot to aquaculture with oysters, which really doesn't affect um, the wild population. So we're starting to see some shifts, but there's just a lot of resistance. It's kind of like passenger pigeons when they would uh, darken the, the uh, daytime. You can never eliminate these. Actually, you can um, if enough people, and again, it's, it's a commodity, but um, we really need to basically create these sanctuaries so they are going to create spawn and then to uh, create other um, oyster reproduction. You think about down to less than 1% of that historical population, and you still want to take every oyster out of the bay. Um, not, not really smart. So hopefully we'll, um, you know, we're, there's a lot of effort in there, and I think there's, we're hearing some things recently in Maryland about some changes in the, the, the season, but I think that um, it's critical that we um, really work to kind of restore those oyster reefs. Thank you. Okay, here's a question. Who should hold the responsibility for creating a strategic plan to better prioritize projects? So many great projects there are. Should, should the efforts be coordinated across the Chesapeake Bay? So we have a lot of great projects. Everybody maybe is working a little bit individually. Is there a coordination role? There's the Chesapeake Bay Commission that does some work, but who should be responsible for doing that coordination in your guys' minds? I sit in a lot of uh, Chesapeake Bay program intergovernmental agency meetings, and I do not think we should be priori she one group that should be prioritizing projects. I think it's great to be information sharing, and I think it's great that there's various coalitions. For example, I'm on the Greater Baltimore Wilderness Coalition. There's uh, in different groups, and I think we should be sharing information as much as possible, but um, sometimes those things can be overly bureaucratic. Um, I think that there's a lot of powerful new tools out there, thanks to technology, that can help point out what's the most efficient thing to do, what's the most cost effective. I think we should use them as much as we can when we compete for grant funds, et cetera. Um, but I think we're better off um, trying to work collectively towards shared goals rather than having it being dictated from the top. That's just my opinion. I agree with you. There's also, um, mostly from a grant perspective, um, it's beneficial if groups realize that um, coming in, you know, trying to further dilute a, a very limited pot of money by coming in individually. When you, if you could look around and say, hmm, there are four maritime museums on the Eastern Shore or whatever, and we're all trying to do the same similar thing, maybe we should go after one bigger chunk of money and figure out a way to share it. Um, but it's not for, as you say, another entity to dictate that. But it, it's very prudent if you can find ways. Partnership scores a lot of points with the granting agencies. And if you can come in with a, a, an overarching program that pushes a lot of buttons, it's a lot better than trying to divvy up limited resources to very you know, slivers of pie to everybody instead of a substantive amount. And we don't have a lot of grants, but I do oversee, the, uh, at this point, the National Park Service's Maritime Heritage Grants. They haven't got any this year, but they've had a few money. The money ran out kind of last year. It'll be a while. They'll get some more. But looking at the agencies that are successful are the ones that try and come in with um, bigger overarching projects that are, are partnerships, and that it seems to go farther. Great. I just have two more questions. One, I, I kind of want to ask a, a question that's been a lot in the news lately. So news out this year was that we risk losing a million species to um, extinction, uh, and it's due to climate change, to overfishing. Um, as managers, how do you think about managing and protecting these resources in this change in climate, or even trying to do restoration? That's a, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Um, I, from my own personal view, uh, so we talked, to, we, um, you mentioned Poplar Island earlier, so that's an island that was a big thriving community that disappeared from sea level rise, and we're rebuilding it with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, as an environmental project, and um, Fish and Wildlife Service has full-time employees that are out there managing the wildlife, and it's really a, a build-it-and-they-will-come sort of 
success story. There's dozens and dozens, I, I think over 30 species of nesting birds, um, which it's an area where where you go out there in the springtime and it's like, it's a birder's paradise. There's baby, um, all kinds of baby birds running around, nests everywhere. It's, it's like Shangri-La out there. And it really is a idea of, you know, build it and they will come. Um, so I think there needs to be more places like Poplar Island where you can have some sort of form of sustainability and a refuge for some species to go to. Not only is there migrating birds, there's migrating monarchs, there's migrating butterflies, there's, mi there's migrating dragonflies. We need to take care of what we have and be really good stewards of the rest and try and make what we have as resilient as possible for the wildlife that's here. That's, that's I see as my limited role. I think some other people at different levels could try and have something a little more ambitious about trying to reverse things. Yeah, we tend to let, um, you know, as long as they're cleaned up appropriately, through both refects through the military and other entities, um, shipwreck sinking deliberately to reef create for shellfish and as nurseries. And that's one of the things Mallows does do is it provides a, um, a, a nursery for both commercial and recreational fish species. But we see it offshore as well. There's a lot of the popular wrecks um, are places where you can go and gather some mussels or a few oysters or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's hard to, it, it, we're such limited options. I mean, with cultural stuff, you know, trying to save species isn't considered my priority, but obviously we try and do that whenever we can as well. But um, yeah, looking at reefs, uh, looking at shipwrecks and, and submerged cultural resources, whether, and NOAA does it in a few places with um, old oil rigs and things, letting them become natural reefs is one of the ways we can help uh, create nurseries for other fisheries. That's, it's a small effort, but it works. I, <clears throat> I also think, too, there's a number of tools that are out there from a lot of different groups. So just the generic term, marine protected area. Uh, those things come in all kinds of shapes, sizes. Some of them are federal, some are state, some are county and local. Um, some of them actually are in the water. Some are wetlands and along the shoreline, natural seashores uh, and the like. And I, and I think that there's, th these are things we need to do. We have marine reserves in a lot of our national marine sanctuaries, areas that really are set aside. You do have to set them aside for the purpose of non-extractive kinds of uses. Let the species begin to come back the way it was mentioned earlier uh, with the oysters. But I, I think, you know, much like the question with the Chesapeake Bay, um, it's, it's great to have, it, the decisions for these things kind of happen locally, but it, at some point there needs to be a function that is set in kind of a common agenda at a, higher, at a higher level. You can't have something going on down here that you don't have a framework for understanding what the, what the cumulative impact is of that decision and similar decisions like that going on. And I think on the opposite side with things like marine protected areas, we do a great job setting these things aside. Um, we don't resource them all that well to manage and to study them and get the public engaged in them the way that we need to. And I would also say that we don't do a very good job of understanding the connectivity uh, to it. Connectivity was brought up a lot in the Chesapeake Bay. You know, it's great if you got a, an oyster bed here and a nice wetland there, but you know, we really need to better understand the functional value of each to each other and what we really need to be setting aside and preserving if we're going to make the Chesapeake better and we're going to make kind of the coastal and ocean areas better. Yeah, I think again, if you look at why a lot of those species are in trouble, I mean, habitat loss is definitely, you know, the, the thing that's, you know, causing a lot of these uh, challenges. But I would say that if you look at, um, you know, things you're gonna do that sort of um, restore these animals and they are quite resilient. But um, again, looking at connectivity, you just think about what one thing could really help the Chesapeake Bay is just this uh, basically riparian forest that's going to help uh, with the siltation. And it's, you're making wildlife corridors. So if you really look at those critical places, and it's amazing today, you know, with the technology, what we can do with tracking animals and finding out where their key um, habitats are and, and really protecting those. But it's just, again, that mindset of like, it doesn't have to be all for humans. It should be, you know, both. and just look at the, the U.S. with the creation of national parks and that whole uh, model that really went around the world. It's, um, it's, it's doable and it's just you know, basically, I think, not letting us stat like that because what's the alternative? Do nothing and then things just go by the wayside. But um, I would always, again, be thinking about you don't wait for 
government to do everything. You look at your backyard, what can you do? Um, and it's much more enjoyable to look out your window and see a bunch of birds or butterflies going by. Um, it's, it's, it can really help enrich your life to uh, kind of, again, get passionate. And I think about Popper Island, and again, um, our state reptile, the Dimeback Terrapin, if you build it, they will come. Well, they came in huge numbers. And um, the interesting thing about Poplar Island, it doesn't have raccoon predators, things like that. So there's a lot of studies going on that we're just learning so much about the life histories of Dimeback Terrapins in a, a really recreated um, environment. Great, I have one more question that I wanna end with from the audience, and that is specifically, what can youth do to help the Chesapeake? I have a lot of ideas, but I was going to let the panelists go for it. Well, a lot of the ideas we've talked about, but I think citizen science is a great way to go. Not only can you, you know, find out more about the species that are there and enter the data. I've also learned there's big data sets that are available to the public for crowdsourcing to try and find trends, connectivity, things we don't have time to get to with research. I think there's tremendous potential there. Um, and, you know, bringing us your youthful energy and your ideas. I mean, if we didn't have young people in our office, I would be lost today because they're bringing to me all the, all the fresh ideas, all the fresh ways of looking at things. So I really value uh, their input. You know, we mentioned earlier the Ocean Guardian program through NOAA for schools. That's schools writ large. But we have homeschooled kids come out, and I've had them come out and do projects. Um, scout troops, and it doesn't have to be a group, you can do it on your own, but there are often events where um, young people can come out. Um, when I was on the Monitor Sanctuary, one of the seats on the Sanctuary Advisory Council was a youth seat. It was a non-voting seat, but it was intended for a, a high school student um, or middle school to high school, and they had to make the commitment and attend and involve themselves, and when they graduated, they moved on and someone else moved up, but they organized events at their school. There's, there are lots of different possibilities, and. Um, all you have to do is you know, get in touch with us. I can find lots of things for kids to do. <laughs> I was a Girl Guide leader for 15 years. I got lots of <laughs> A couple of uh, things maybe to add to that point. Um, there's a saying that, um, that uh, children don't inherit the earth um, from us. We adults borrow it from them. And so I think one of the things that um, youth can really do is make sure their voices are heard. If this is actually important to you, it is never too early to voice your opinion to elected officials to let them know um, that this is something that you care, whether you're voting age or not. But um, making this a, a priority and letting them know it's a priority to you, I think is one of the really effective things you can do. I think the other thing, Susan alluded to the Ocean Guardian um, program, and it's a great opportunity to find ways to involve schools in terms of watershed conservation efforts. And through that kind of individual type of program, you can actually do a lot in terms of educating across the schools and changing behaviors that are not only changed at the school, but often changed in the community overall. I can't tell you how many, I think it's been youth groups that have actually been the ones that led to single-use plastic bag bans or stopping wrappers and stuff. So what, what youth can really do by taking action, I think, can have a huge impact um, across whole communities. So I think one good way to do it, I think probably everybody here has some sort of volunteer program or a kind of youth leadership program involved in the agency. So those are actually all good ways um, to get involved as well. So please join me in thanking our incredible panelists tonight. They were fantastic. Thank you. I want to again thank the National Aquarium for this uh, incredible opportunity and let you know that they have more events and speakers in the work. And you can go to aqua.org backslash lecture to learn more about that. And in, if you're interested in learning more about the aquarium's work or joining their uh, email list, go to aqua.org as well. Again, thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful evening. And once again, I'd like to invite you to Capitol Hill Ocean Week, June 9th through the 11th. Thank you. <laughs>